On November 23, 1943, after three days of endless fighting, the Allied invasion of the Gilbert Islands, known as Operation Galvanic, was ending. Positioned in the Central Pacific, over 2,000 miles away from Pearl Harbor, the loss of the Gilberts was not just a territorial retreat, but a significant dent in their strategic defense and a blow to their military confidence. As the Allied forces gained ground, the Japanese command, taken by surprise, scrambled to respond. A desperate admiral, Minichi Kogan, issued orders to recall four Japanese submarines southwest of Hawaii and five more near Truk and Rabaul to converge on the Gilberts. Nine of those Japanese subs fought against U.S. forces in the Gilberts, and six were lost. The Japanese desperately needed a win. Then, that night, after arriving off Macon, the Japanese submarine I-175, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Sunao Tabata, spotted the perfect target. The escort carrier, USS Liscombe Bay, right in the middle of a protective formation, with a two-ship wide gap on her side. The perfect opportunity for chaos. On August 7, 1943, USS Liscombe Bay began service in the U.S. Navy. Named after a small bay off the southern coast of Alaska, she was one of the 50 Casablanca-class 14,000-ton escort carriers being mass-produced at the Henry J. Kaiser shipyards using modified merchant ship hulls. At 512 feet long, with a 400-foot-long, 80-foot-wide flight deck, these were known as Jeep Carriers, a nickname that originated due to their smaller size and less powerful armament when compared to full-sized fleet carriers. For operations, Liscombe Bay had one 5-inch 38 caliber dual-purpose gun, eight twin 40mm Beaufort anti-aircraft guns, and 30 20mm Ehrlichan anti-aircraft cannons, a typical combination of weaponry designed for both offensive air support and defensive capabilities against air and surface threats. Captain Irving D. Wiltsey, the ship's first commanding officer, had already served as a navigator on the carrier USS Yorktown during the Battle of Midway the previous year and also commanded a smaller ship. From the beginning, Wiltsey was liked by his crew of 960 men, most of whom were recent boot camp graduates. However, a lot of them had already served and seen the worst in the Pacific, as many had been first-hand witnesses of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. One of these men was Doris Miller, a cook with no formal combat training, who, after helping move his wounded captain to a safer location, manned an anti-aircraft machine gun and relentlessly fired at the attacking Japanese planes until running out of ammunition. For his heroic actions, he became the first African American to receive the Navy Cross. But the team wasn't complete just yet. On October 11th, after over a month of trials and tests, the vessel received a key addition to her complement, Rear Admiral Henry Maston Mullenix. Mullenix, a well-liked leader, was set to command Task Force 52-3 with Liscombe Bay as his flagship and Captain John G. Cromelin as his chief of staff. This group was made up of Liscombe Bay, along with fellow Jeep escort carriers Corregidor and Coral Sea, and a total of 48 Wildcat fighters, trained for ground attack, and 36 Avenger torpedo bombers, meant for bombing and anti-submarine warfare. With Liscombe Bay at the forefront, this carrier group and others were assigned an important role in a major American offensive. Through Operation Galvanic, the Allies were set to capture all three atolls in the Gilbert Islands as a stepping stone for future landings in the nearby Marshall Islands, establish airfields and naval bases, and gain valuable amphibious operations experience. A few days after Mullenix's arrival, the carrier received her first batch of aircraft, 12 Wildcat fighters and 16 Avenger torpedo bombers, meant for Liscombe Bay's Composite Squadron 39, or BC-39, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Marshal U. Beebe. With the team finally assembled, Liscombe Bay departed from Pearl Harbor on November 10th. For nine days, the escort carrier and her crew performed flight operations and anti-aircraft gunnery practice. They provided aircraft for anti-submarine patrols as Task Group 52-3 steamed towards its distant objective in a 2,300-mile ride. Beginning on November 20, 1943, Rear Admiral Mullenix's task force, including three sister Jeep carriers, fought gallantly in the opening stages of the Gilberts' invasion, with the primary function to protect and attack transports 
when Jurawa and Mekun Atolls were ambushed. The next three days were hectic for Captain Wiltsey, Rear Admiral Mullenix, Captain Cromelin, Doris Miller, and everyone working aboard Liscombe Bay. But especially hard was the work performed by the ship's squadron, led by Lieutenant Commander Beebe, with many of the inherent dangers of carrier operations, even without enemy engagement, present daily. Even before arriving at the Macon landings, one Wildcat crashed, and another had to resort to emergency landings. But after three bitter fighting days and heavy losses for the Marines who ambushed the islands, the Gilberts were finally taken. Operation Galvanic had been a success. At sundown on November 23rd, the ships of the task group maneuvered into night cruising disposition, forming a circular screen around the three escort carriers, with Liscombe Bay in the middle as a proud guide for the surrounding ships. But that night, something else was lurking in the waters. And when a Japanese bomber dropped flares to illuminate the American flat tops, this mystery stalker, I-175, a newly arrived enemy submarine following the formation, caught a clear view of Liscombe Bay, then cruising near Butaratari Island. The submarine, a KD-6B subclass led by Commander Sunao Tabata, began planning for a surprise attack. By the early morning of the next day, less than an hour before the sun came out, the carrier's crew and the men of VC-39 were exhausted. The past three days had been busy, and they expected that November 24th would bring more of the same. Aboard the flat top, at 4.50 a.m., the deck crew took their positions to launch the day's first aircraft, and the men began manhandling 13 planes onto the flight deck in preparation for a dawn launch. All the while, seven planes rested on the hangar deck, armed but unfueled, ready for later launch. Stowed within the escort carrier's magazine were over 200,000 pounds of ordnance, including semi-armor-piercing bombs and a large number of torpedo warheads. But down in the galleys and mess halls, it was hectic for other reasons, as it was also the eve of Thanksgiving. All over these rooms, cooks were breaking out the frozen turkeys that had been packed at Pearl Harbor, and there was a lot of work to do to prep for a traditional American holiday meal. At 5.05 a.m., and dawn was only half an hour away, pilots and air crewmen climbed into their planes. While this happened, the task group executed a turn to the northeast, leading Liscombe Bay to present her side to I-175, complete with a gap left by the USS Hull and USS Franks escort destroyers, which had previously become detached. Now, Lieutenant Commander Sunao Tabata's submarine was in front of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Unbeknownst to him, for some reason, None of the destroyers in the task group detected I-175 on sonar, and no one would see a torpedo wake on the surface until it was too late. And at 5.13 a.m., an officer stationed at one of Liscombe Bay's guns on the starboard side frantically picked up his phone and screamed, quote, Here comes a torpedo. An explosion rocked Liscombe Bay, and a mushroom cloud of flames spread as the sun rose above, hurling fragments of the ship shrapnel and aircraft into the air. Seconds later, an even larger explosion followed. In an instant, the interior of the aft portion of the carrier blazed with the utmost intensity, and half of her virtually disintegrated from one moment to the next. As more and more explosions shook the flat top, she continued to burn furiously, and it was soon clear to all the other ships in the formation that their guiding flat top had just been hit in the worst possible spot, the weapons magazine. From nearby Corregidor, Liscombe Bay's bridge seemed to glow a bright cherry red. All over the ship, the crewmen quickly realized that trying to fight the raging fires without water pressure was hopeless, and they began to abandon the ship. But while they were desperately trying to escape, the tremendous waves of heat engulfing the carrier's island made the bridge rails too hot to touch. Gone was Doris Miller, the naval hero, as well as Captain Wiltsey but dozens of sailors were still left fighting for their lives all over the ship. One of the VC-39 pilots, Frank Sistrunk, who'd had his appendix removed on board only six days earlier, decided to risk it all and jumped overboard. He made it to a life raft several hundred yards away with the help of his comrades. But other VC-39 pilots, scheduled for a later flight, had been asleep when the torpedo hit and were not so lucky. 
John Cromelin, Mullenix's chief of staff, was barely out of the shower when the ship exploded. Nude, he hurriedly fought his way through burning compartments of the flight deck, well aware of the irony of his state of undress, given that fire protection was one of the earliest lessons taught to young sailors. But despite receiving burns on the right side of his face, legs, and arms, Cromelin continued to take charge of the evacuation of the men in his area before jumping overboard himself. Still stark naked, Cromelin swam for nearly an hour, supported only by a cork float, before being rescued. Finally, the fate of Admiral Henry Mullenix is unknown. Some men remember seeing him seated at a desk with his head between his arms, while others recalled seeing him swimming away from the ship after it went down. Whichever it was, no one saw Mullenix again. As USS Liscombe Bay began sinking, BC-39 Commander Beebe, a survivor of the ordeal, recalled, quote, Liscombe Bay went down gracefully, settling by the stern, going down fast, and sliding backward. Her final farewell was an audible hiss as the white-hot metal cooled. The ship's bow was enveloped by a cloud of steam, obliterating our view. And so, after only 23 minutes, USS Liscombe Bay ended her short 11-month service off Macon Atoll in the Pacific as she sank stern first, still burning furiously, according to more than one survivor, like a 4th of July display. Liscombe Bay was gone, taking with her 70% of the crew. Only 55 officers and 217 enlisted men had survived, injured in varying degrees of gravity. They were rescued from the oil-thick waters, primarily by the destroyers Morris and Hughes. Clinging to life rafts, bits of wreckage, or floating in K-Pak life jackets, according to a Navy report, quote, it was a miracle that anyone managed to escape such a roaring inferno. After the eight-day voyage, the Liscombe Bay survivors arrived in Pearl Harbor on December 2, 1943. That same day, the Navy Department issued an epitaph that read, quote, The USS Liscombe Bay was sunk as a result of being torpedoed by a submarine on November 24, 1943, in the Gilbert Islands area. This is the only ship lost in the Gilbert Islands campaign. While Liscombe Bay was the first jeep carrier to go, by the time World War II ended in 1945, Five more American-built escort carriers were sunk by enemy action as they continued to dodge kamikazes, supported beach landings, fought against overwhelming odds in Leyte Gulf, and hunted German U-boats in the Atlantic. But none of these other losses could compare to the shock that went through America's escort crews when Jeep carrier Liscombe Bay, the deadliest sinking of a carrier in the history of the United States Navy, went down in November 1943. 